good night for some people uh, in Australia. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be speaking at uh, this conference, which is centered in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot do it in person, but uh, hopefully in the future we will be able to do that. So yesterday I spoke about early onset sepsis. And as you know, these are usually or frequently very sick babies. They have dramatic presentations, often re requiring high degrees of, res of uh, respiratory and cardiovascular support. Uh, with a mortality rate in term babies, probably about 1%. Now, healthcare associated infections, though, are of a magnitude more importance because they are 10 to 100 times more common uh, than early on sepsis in babies. And they too can be associated with adverse outcomes, both increased morbidity and mortality. I enjoy giving this lecture because it gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about history and for one of my heroes um, in medicine, and that is Dr. Ignaz Philip Semmelweis, who you can see lived in the 1800s. So Dr. Semmelweis was not a neonatologist or an infectious disease expert. He was an obstetrician and he was working in the uh, main uh, obstetrical hospital in Vienna. He actually grew up in Budapest, but had moved to Vienna for some of his training. And when he got there in the 1840s, sort of where this arrow is in the screen, he looked at the mortality rate of women in childbirth, uh, which was between five and 10%, and compared it to a hospital in Dublin where it was uh, less than 2% and, and became frightened. And I just wanna point out on the screen, go back one slide, that the rise in the mortality in, in uh, Vienna occurred about here and that was the beginning of anatomical pathology in Vienna. Before that, they had not had a department of anatomical pathology. And why was that important? Because when someone died, everybody would go to the autopsy room and perform an autopsy. And as you can see in this picture here, none of the individuals would be wearing gloves. So they would do the autopsy, obviously dry their hands off, and then go up to the obstetrical ward and uh, examine women in childbirth. So, um, let me get rid of this. So, Semmelweis said, said to himself, I wonder if there's a connection between what happens in the autopsy room and the women who are dying in, in childbirth. And then something else happened. They separated the women who were being cared for by midwives. And the mortality rate in those women went down dramatically, shown in the blue line on the slide. And the mortality rate of women cared for by doctors went up the difference is that midwives never went to the autopsy room. They didn't believe in practical instruction for women and therefore their mortality, the, the mortality of those women went down while the mortality of uh, the doctors again went up. And finally, someone said to himself, not knowing about bacteria or germs, said there's something that must be transmitted from those women in autopsy. And what did he do? He made everybody soak, soak their hands in a chlorinated lime solution uh, before they did pelvic examination of women in childbirth. And the mortality rate, as you can see here, and this is actually is from uh, Semmelweis's diary. Uh, you can see when the chlorine hand wash was introduced, went down dramatically. And uh, Semmelweis wrote a very famous monograph called The Etiology and Understanding and Prevention of Childbed Fever, which is called, the, called these purple infections. And unfortunately is rebuffed uh, across the medical community. Uh, and Semmelweis uh, then moved to Budapest, back to Budapest, he was born in Budapest. And people basically thought he was crazy. And he had some psychological disorders and he died at the age of 47. Uh, he died in an asylum and back in those days, he used to try to beat the bad spirits out of you. And he died from a combination of trauma and from infection. Obviously a very significant individual medical history. And in Vienna, when you go, in Budapest, when you go there, you can see Semmelweis University. So here's my outline for this morning for the next 30 minutes. Identification of risk factors, which result in healthcare associated infections and how we can avoid them. And then I'm gonna speak specifically about CLAPSIs, central line associated bloodstream infections, the issue of predictive monitoring and try to give you some uh, brief conclusions. So why do we worry about these uh, healthcare associated infections? 
And I say it's the three M's, money, mortality, and mental deficiency. And these numbers are a little bit old now, but in the US, as of about eight or nine years ago, there were more than 100,000 deaths secondary to healthcare associated infections, both in adults and children. And the estimate back then was six and a half billion dollars. I would bet it's close to uh, a trillion dollars now. And clearly it is worldwide. Now the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which reimburses hospital for expenses, will not reimburse a hospital where there's a catheter associated bloodstream infection. They consider those never events. It's like falling out of bed. An individual should not have one of those infections. Data from the neonatal research network says it's close to half of all deaths beyond two weeks of age are due to infectious complications. We all know that healthcare associated infections are associated with poor neurodevelopmental outcomes. And I'll show you those data in a second. And they're unfortunately too common. So here we have data from two different databases. The National Healthcare Safety Network, which is uh, a consortium of hospitals in the US. And uh, these are shown in this slide, in these numbers going down, the black numbers going down. Uh, on, in parentheses are data from the International Nosocomial Infection Control Consortium, which are data from across the world. And on the left here, you see babies of different uh, birth weights, less than 750 to 2,500 grams. And as you might imagine, looking at the data from the US, the numbers go down as babies get bigger. That makes sense, smaller babies uh, have an increased susceptibility to infection and are often more critically ill. But if you look at the international data, it's a little surprising to me. The numbers don't go down at all where you'd expect them. They sort of go up and down and don't change significantly from that weight group, less than 750 up to 2,500 grams. And it says to me that some of the problem, but not all the problem internationally may have to do with hand hygiene. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is the best study I've looked at uh, in terms of economics. It's a few years old now, but it looked at the cost of intensive care um, in babies who have an infection, which is shown in yellow on this graph versus babies who do not have an infection. And they broke it down to different birth weight groups. You can see that the bottom, on the x-axis at the bottom. And we see two sets of bars. One set of bars is observed and the second set of bars is adjusted for confounding variables. And at almost every birth weight category, babies with infection have a higher mean cost. The actual numbers, if you look at the right part of the slide, uh, again, broken down to different birth weight uh, categories is shown here. So at each birth weight grouping, the difference is about $30,000. So babies with nosocomial infection, which is what they called healthcare associated infections, was about $30,000 more than babies who did not have such an infection. And it also varied by the kind of pathogen. So down over here, we have no nosocomial infection with a mean cost of about $50,000. Here's coagulative negative staphylococcus, an increase in it for that pathogen, uh, about $50,000. Other bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, a little bit higher, and fungi being the most expensive. And these are data from Barbara Stolen from the uh, Neonatal Research Network published a number of years ago, but it's since been replicated in other publications looking at the outcomes of ELBW babies who are infected. And the four outcomes we're looking at are mental development index less than 70, psychomotor development index less than 70, cerebral palsy and microcephaly. And almost everything you see in the slide, in fact, I've colored it differently in blue, is significantly different for babies with infection. So all of these outcomes, whether it be poor development, cerebral palsy or microcephaly, is more common in babies who have a healthcare associated infection. Now I'm gonna just uh, change topics and talk specifically about CLABSIs, central line associated bloodstream infections. And these are five different articles looking at the pathogens responsible for central line associated bloodstream infections. And in fact, they're pretty similar to one another. They're from across the world, US and Europe and the Middle East. And you can see here that for most of these studies, Coagulase negative staphylococci are by far the most common cause of central line infections. This last study, which I'm going to talk about in detail, is from Yale uh, 
and it, it is different because it's less of a cause. Second, followed by coagulase negative staphylococcus are gram negatives, staphylococcus aureus, and finally fungi and enteric groups. Let's look at this publication from Yale, which was published uh, a couple of years ago. So they broke it down to three different time periods, 89 through 2003, 2004 to 2009, and then most recently, 2010 to 2013. And you see coagulase negative staphylococcus, pretty common, but in this final epoch, it was only 3%. And during that time, staphylococcus aureus and gram negatives became much more prominent. So what happened in this last epoch? Here it is graphically. Here is where they um, showed a start, a marked decrease in infections due to coagulase negative staphylococcus. And what the, happened at, at that time was they instituted prevention bundles for these kinds of infections, which I will talk about in some detail in a moment, but they stopped doing central line blood cultures. Now you're gonna hear me say that whenever possible, try to get two blood cultures in a baby, but one of them probably should not be a central line infection because lines become colonized pretty easily. And just because you recover an organism from a line does not mean a baby's infected. So my approach to interpreting blood cultures for coagulase negative staphylococcus in a symptomatic baby, I try when it's possible, not always possible, to draw two peripheral blood cultures and then begin broad spectrum antibiotics. I'll talk about treatment in a moment. And then I look what I what, look at the results of those cultures. If both cultures are negative for coagulase negative staphylococcus, obviously there's no sepsis. If one culture is positive and the other is negative, I call that a contaminant. If both cultures are positive, then that's C coagulase, ne uh, coagulase negative staphylococcal bacteremia. But I do not draw a blood culture from a central line. This is a, a list of the risk factors for central line associated bloodstream infections based on a number of publications from around the world. And they're pretty similar in that the strongest risk factor is um, birth weight and gestation. The tiniest babies, ELBW babies or micropremies, have the highest risk of infection. Pretty obviously, they have the most problems with their immune system. They also have the most invasive monitoring and are at the greatest risk of a healthcare associated infection. So parental alimentation, central lines, obvious risk factors. Lipid is, is thought to be an independent risk factor for infection. Steroids for BPD, um, used less frequently now, but a risk factor. Histamine blockers, proton pump inhibitors are both associated with healthcare associated infections and even NEC. From a research viewpoint, low serum IgG levels at the time of birth uh, predict a baby who's at higher risk to uh, develop a nosocomial infection. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna talk about it, giving IgG to babies has not been shown to decrease uh, the risk of a healthcare associated infection by more than a few percentage points. Sicker babies, prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, overcrowding in a NICU, heavy workloads for the staff for nurses and doctors. And it's also in some studies, staffing problems in inexperienced nurses. But I would tell you the problem is not, or may not reside with nurses. This is a survey study from the United Kingdom of about 85 NICUs uh, throughout the UK. And they looked at nosocomial bacteremia, which is shown on the y-axis, uh, shown over here. And look at three outcomes, excuse me. Uh, they looked at patient volume, consultant availability, and nursing provision. So in units with high patient volume, shown on the left side of the slide, there were more infections that probably took care of sicker babies. The number of nurses present, nursing provision, did not determine the rates of nosocomial bacteremia, but the number of consultants shown in the middle set of two bars over here uh, was higher when there was a lot of bacteremia, nosocomial bacteremia, uh, and lower numbers of consultants where there was less nosocomial bacteremia. And I interpret this that the doctors have a hard time washing their hands using good hand hygiene on a regular basis. So if we're gonna prevent these infections, we have to have a case definition for a clapsy. 
and this is from the World Health and CDC, that you need a recognized pathogen uh, in at least one or more blood culture bottles not related to infection at another site. So if someone has an abscess on their arm or leg and develops a bacteremia, that's not a flapsy. Or you can have a common skin contaminant like coagulase negative staphylococcus, but there you need at least two positive blood cultures, again, not related to infection at another site. And there's often associated signs and symptoms, fever or hypothermia, apnea, bradycardia, or in severe infections, hypotension. Now, we use the World Health Organization recommendations for hand hygiene. And as I travel around the world, I see this picture in most NICUs. They describe the importance of hand hygiene and when to do it. So if you look at number one, before touching the patient, that's pretty obvious. Before doing a, a sterile procedure, after touching the patient, uh, after a body fluid exposure, all of those are sort of um, obvious. But if you look at number five on this slide, after touching the patient's surroundings, that's the one we tend to forget most. So when I make rounds in our NICU in New York, uh, we, we've been walking around for two hours, invariably somebody, one of the residents, leans their hand on the isolate or the counter. And when I see that, I usually stop around and say, please use hand hygiene. We forget that whatever is colonizing the baby is also in the environment. And it's important that if you touch any environmental area that you have all those individuals uh, use good hand hygiene. Why do we use hand hygiene? Because it's effective in getting rid of the bacteria which cause these kinds of infections. So at the bottom of the slide, you see a little cartoon. You see uh, bacteria, some of them living in little tents uh, in the skin, and then you see some riding a bicycle. The resident bacteria are deep within the skin and hand hygiene techniques probably don't get rid of most of those resident bacteria. But the transient bacteria sit very superficially and it's those bacteria that are, that are cause most healthcare associated infections. And using a hand hygiene technique that degerms, one of the uh, combinations of alcohol plus an emollient are very effective in eradicating those trench and flora. And here's the recommendations from the CDC and World Health Organization. And I put on, for some of them, the strength of the recommendation with 1A being the highest and three being the lowest. So one is using, using an alcohol-based hand rub for de decontaminating hands, getting rid of the transient bacteria. If the hands are visibly dirty, or contaminated with a, a body secretion, a body fluid or blood, then you have to use soap and water. And I put on the slide, I prefer using a non-antimicrobial soap and water rather than an antimicrobial soap and water. We try to avoid these and try to avoid uh, bacterial resistance. So we just use plain old soap and water if our hands are dirty. We try not to use soaps and detergents that are strongly anionic or cationic because they cause redness of the hands. And I know when I used to come in uh, a few years ago and I examined 30 babies in the NICU, by the end of the 30 babies, my hand would be red and uh, hurting. And it's those kinds of detergents which damage the skin. And remember, damaged skin harbors more pathogens. Brushes that are longer recommended, even though surgeons still use them, that's a 1B recommendation. Do not use artificial nails or extenders. Uh, we had an epidemic in my NICU, which we published in the England Journal of Medicine several years ago. And it started with a nurse who was colonized with pseudomonas underneath her uh, artificial nails. And when those were finally removed, the epidemic ended. And they also say, keep natural hair short, makes sense. No dark nail polishes, because you can't tell extenders if you're using dark nail polishes and clear nail polishes is acceptable. The time to wear gloves is when you're gonna come in contact with blood or any other infectious material um, from mucous membranes or non-insect skin. We try to have the hand washing um, uh, facilities at every bedside so we don't have to start searching around uh, for a way to de-germ. And importantly, and I'm sure many of you do this, we, wa we watch closely the practices of our healthcare workers. And who does that? They're usually medical students who need a few dollars and they sit in the NICU, especially in the morning, 
And when I go there to examine a baby, they have a little checklist and they fill it out and they make sure that I use good hand hygiene before and after examining the baby. And if anybody doesn't, whether it be a chief of surgery or a nurse or some other person working in the NICU, a report is sent out uh, to me and then I can contact that individual about improving their hand hygiene. But the, just knowing that there's a secret observer in the nursery help, has helped improve our compliance rate with hand hygiene. And this is our bundle. I talked about bundles, groups of interventions, which have proven effective for decreasing flapsy. And very briefly, hand hygiene, most importantly, um, when you're inserting a catheter, we use sterile gloves and a sterile barrier. We use chloroprep, a combination of chlorhexidine plus alcohol for skin antisepsis whenever we put in central lines, except for umbilical catheters. We try to choose a catheter site, site selection in the upper extremities, although I'm not sure that it makes a big difference. And this is important. We, we review uh, every day, is that line necessary? Can we get it out as soon as possible? And whenever we access the lines, obviously hand hygiene, uh, before and after access, maintaining aseptic technique. We date our tubing in case it needs to be changed. And importantly, we scrub the hub with chlorhexidine or alcohol for 15 seconds. Why do we do that? We do it because when there are indwelling lines on babies that are maintained for an extended period of time, the infection does not occur external to the catheter. The infection comes through contamination which goes into internal to the catheter and into the bloodstream. Therefore, decontaminating this area here has helped decrease uh, the rate of healthcare associated flapsies. Do they work? The answer is yes. Uh, nowadays, if we have one flapsy in our NICU and we have a very high complexity uh, NICU with lots of sick babies, it's always a, a, a source of consternation. We try to have every month go by without a flapsy infection. We're not always perfect, but most uh, months that is true. So how do you manage them? Well, one, if you don't, if there's a infection due to Staphylococcus aureus, you try to get the line out pretty quickly. In fact, if there's any positive blood culture, uh, we try to get the line it, unless it is mandatory, unless it is absolutely essential to the baby's well-being. For fungus, it's mandatory. Always remove the line. For Staphylococcus aureus, it's usually mandatory. Again, if it's vital to the infant's well-being, you can give antibiotics through the central line, but again, not for those two kinds of pathogens. Coagulase negative staphylococcus can be treated with a central line in place. And remember, if you have a central line blood culture positive for coagulase negative staphylococcus, that often represents colonization and not infection. And how about treatment? When collapse is suspected, there are two choices. The one we prefer to use at Columbia now in many centers across the country is oxacillin and genomycin. This combination, vancomycin, is probably acceptable, except we try to avoid vancomycin use and, and, and decrease the likelihood of a vancomycin-resistant pathogen. And starting with oxacillin and then switching to vancomycin does not increase mortality. Once you have a pathogen identified and its sensitivities, obviously, we're going to narrow the uh, coverage, antibiotic coverage, we treat coagulase negative staphylococcus for about seven days, uh, making sure the bacteremia has ended once we start antibiotics. Staphylococcus aureus for 14 days and gram negatives for seven to 10 days. And in conclusion about TLAPSI, avoid care practices which bypass skin barrier defense mechanism. That can be as simple as heel sticks or umbilical catheters and central lines. Try not to use drugs which are associated with these kinds of infections, steroids for BPD, uh, histamine blockers or proton pump inhibitors. When you have a baby who's colonized with a resistant or an invasive microorganism, use gown and gloves, limit the use of antibiotics, and when needed, use the simplest and most appropriate drug. And that's why we use oxacillin instead of vancomycin. We use the alcohol-based emollients at every bedside. It does improve compliance. Try to avoid your own skin damage uh, by scrubbing your hand with brushes, brushes or avoiding scrubbing your hand with brushes. Breast milk feedings, 
minimize central venous catheter days, and use sterile batteries for central line insertion and line maintenance. And now I'm going to end by talking about um, how you diagnose these infections. Obviously, at the top of this list is physical examination. And when you're concerned, you get a blood culture, urine culture, usually because these are late onset infections, CSF culture, not routinely unless the baby is not responding to usual antibiotic therapy where there's a positive blood culture. And then we get laboratory testing, not uncommonly white count and differential count or acute phase reactants, C-reactive protein or procalcitonin. Now for many years, interleukins, cytokines have been thought about as a good way to diagnose infection. And this is one of many articles published a number of years ago, looking at interleukin-6 in babies with proven sepsis those with clinical sepsis and controls. And it goes up very quickly and comes down very quickly. In proven sepsis, the same is true for clinical sepsis, and the numbers are significantly higher than controls. But there's always been a question about how good a marker is it before babies become infected. And in 1998, um, Georg Simbrother and Helmut Kuster from Munich did this really neat study where they followed babies sequentially and measure a number of acute phase reactants and cytokines. And on this slide here, uh, in the uh, orange is C-reactive protein, which you see goes up on the basically on the day of infection or shortly before the, the day of infection. And then there are two cytokines, interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and IL-6, which rise several days before cytokines are present excuse me, before infection is present. Well, you say to yourself, well, it's pretty hard to measure cytokines. Is there a simpler way? And there is a simpler way, and that has to do with predictive monitoring and monitoring of vital signs. Now, most of the vital signs we measure in the NICU, heart rate, respiratory rate, saturation, and blood pressure are pretty nonspecific. We look at them. If there's an acute event, we intervene, but they're late markers or relatively late markers of cardiopulmonary compromise. But there's a growing interest in using the waveforms and the correlations between the waveforms in a way to predict cytokinemia or predict a baby is going to have an adverse event. I'm sure you know this, but organs in the body talk to one another all the time. And that's through anatomic means, neural or endocrine channels. In healthy individuals and in healthy babies, this results in variability of heart rate, Breathing, breathing, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, temperature. And there's no relationship that we can see between those values. So it all looks pretty chaotic to us. But in a stressful situation, variability in organ system readout decreases. So we call that decomplexification. And the decrease in variability in various organs signals a pathological process and may represent an opportunity for early detection. So the most well-studied way to identify babies with sepsis is by looking at heart rate variability. It's the HERO monitor. The HERO monitor focuses on heart rate variability and uses these three variables. Looks at the standard deviation of heart rate, um, the irregularity of heart rate, and looks for decelerations because it's known that when there is an infection, signals are carried back to the brain and then the brain in turn sends out other signals to the heart and elsewhere in the body which can either e increase or decrease heart rate and decrease probability. So using heart rate variability or the HERO score, it's a way of predicting when a baby is likely to have a serious or life-threatening infection. This is what the HERO mantra looks like in a healthy uh, baby. So the HERO score it's a number, not more, not more than anything else. And here a score score is low here. There is heart rate variability. And here's a baby who is getting, actually had an infection where the HERA score goes up considerably. And if you look at the heart rate, well, you say to yourself, doesn't look so bad to me, but you can see here, there are these brief periods of decelerations, very hard to detect or impossible to detect in, in the NICU but using the HERO monitor, they're easy to detect through the algorithm. And it's used as an early detection system for sick babies. And recently we've worked on a new um, way of looking at early detection. 
That's the cross correlation of heart rate and saturation. We've done that in collaboration with um, our group and, and uh, workers at the University of Virginia. And we looked at heart rate, saturation, and respiratory rate. I remember I said that in a healthy individual, there's no correlation between those physiologic parameters. This is a baby who is um, nine hours prior to E. coli sepsis or dying from E. sepsis. And you see the marked correlation in the heart rate, saturation, and breathing pattern. In fact, if you look at the relative risk of late onset sepsis at NEC, where there's not a good correlation in those values, here we're looking at heart rate and saturation, the cross correlation, the risk of sepsis is very low, it's one or less. And when there is a good correlation in the next 24 hours, the risk of uh, sepsis or NEC goes up to greater than three. So in summary, healthcare associated infections are an immense problem. I know that it's true in about every NICU I've ever visited. They increase mortality and morbidity, add trillions of dollars to the cost worldwide. And I'm gonna say that almost all Plapsy infections can be prevented by using the bundle. Um, I, we still have them, uh, but I think most can be prevented. And I think that the future are predictive algorithms and continuous monitoring of physiologic variables, which are gonna provide an early warning for babies who are having a Plapsy event. Again, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today.